Hello. Hello. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, welcome to the 2020 Summer Systematics Internship at the California Academy of Sciences um, Research Symposium. Um, my name is Rebecca Johnson, and I'm here with Lauren Esposito. We are the co-directors of the Summer Systematics Program. Um, we're thrilled to have um, a subset of our students, some of them presented earlier, but a subset of our students presenting the research they've done this summer um, to you this afternoon. So the Summer Systematics Institute is a National Science Foundation Research Experiences for Undergraduates program. So it's funded by the National Science Foundation. Um, this is 2020 is the 25th year of the Summer Systematics Institute. So it's really something to celebrate celebrate our students this year, but also celebrate the longevity of this program. And this is one of the longest running REU programs in the country, definitely the longest at a natural history museum. So the students that you'll hear from today join a group of around 250 other undergraduate students um, who have had their some of their first research experiences here at the Academy, um, working with our curators and scientists. So we had a wonderful summer working with these students. Um, it was a challenging summer, um, not because of the students, but because of the coronavirus and the, the virtual situation that we found ourselves in. Um, but the research that they've done, the, the cohort, the group, the team feeling that they've built, even with all of the obstacles that were put in their, their path to get here um, is really inspiring. and. I think makes Lauren and I both really happy that we continued with the program. And so we wanna take this opportunity to thank the institution for supporting us in bringing the students um, to, out to San Francisco, which you'll hear a little bit more about and supporting our endeavor to keep this program going during COVID and all of the instructors, um, Sarah Cruz and Gio Rapicciolo, all of our colleagues that gave lectures and um, guest, guests were guest speakers, um, all of our colleagues who came camping with us and shared their expertise. And we couldn't do this program without you. Um, so thank you so much. Um, I'm gonna turn it over to Lauren and then we'll hear from our interns. Uh, I'd just like to echo a lot of the things that Rebecca said. This, this summer has been an adventure. It's been an experiment. Uh, this, all of our interns were incredible, uh, particularly in the way that they sort of took it in stride, all the changes and all the ups and downs and uncertainty of the entire summer. Um, they were all absolutely incredible. Just to give you kind of a sense of what our what our summer was like, uh, this was a nine week research internship. Um, and we originally advertised it thinking we would all be spend the summers here in the building. Um, starting last fall, we had mentors already thinking about projects that they wanted to do with their future interns the next summer. Um, and and when they were thinking of those projects, they certainly weren't thinking of them in a fully virtual, completely digital uh, context. We usually have our interns come here into the academy. They work here in the building. They work in our Center for Comparative Genomics, um, doing genomics research. Um, they work in our, our SEM lab, doing microscopy. They work with specimens in person. And so the transition for us as a natural history museum um, from in person to completely digital was was a lot of unknowns and it was unknowns for both the, the mentors and the students and us as the program directors. Um, but everyone rolled with the punches and all, all agreed that we were ready, willing and able to do this regardless of what format it took. And we really, really appreciate that. Um, so our interns participated in an online virtual class uh, that was taught by, by Sarah, uh, as well as an art workshop taught by Geo. Um, so thank you both again, that was fantastic. Um, as well as guest lectures from, I think, pretty much every scientist in the building. Uh, so thank you all for sharing your expertise. Um, and really excitingly, this summer, we were able to bring some, some former um, SSI uh, uh, interns from years past, like some many years past, uh, to talk about their experiences after, like life after SSI. Um, Rebecca didn't mention, but she <laughs> was in the first cohort ever of the SSI program. Uh, and so along the way, there's been a lot of incredible folks that have come through these doors and gone on to do great things, both inside of biodiversity science and outside of biodiversity scientists, science. So our interns got to hear all about the, maybe like just a couple of the ways that they could 
go and directions they can move in post SSI. Uh, about halfway through the summer, we were able to bring them here. Um, they had to engage in a really strict quarantine both before they left their homes as well as after they arrived to ensure that we kept everybody safe and COVID free. Uh, and since then, they've been able to be together interacting as a cohort. We've gone on camping trips to the Sierra Nevadas, to the Santa Cruz Mountains, down to the tide pools along the California coast. Uh, and we've tried to approximate what life was like before COVID. And I think that we've done a really great job. And, and big thanks to all these interns that have led the way for all of us. Um, so I think with that, maybe I'll um, go ahead and get, get this get this, uh, this symposium started. Um, we're gonna hear about the research that they've done virtually uh, and the, the ways that we've been able to adapt their research projects to that new virtual reality. So uh, I'm gonna hand it over to Rebecca to introduce our first speaker. Great, um, thanks so much, Lauren. Um, so for all of you that are listening live, um, feel free to ask questions in the chat. Um, we'll be asking those questions to our interns after they finish speaking. So um, I'd like to introduce our first speaker, Jasmine Pappas, who goes to Purdue University. This summer she worked with Gary Williams and today she'll be presenting her research on taxonomic diversity and bathymetric zonation of deep sea coral off the coast of California. There you go, Jasmine, right, take it away. You, Rebecca. Hi, I'm Jasmine Pappas, and this summer I worked on taxonomic diversity and bathymetric zonation of deep sea coral off the coast of California alongside my advisor, Gary Williams, who's a curator of invertebrate zoology here at the Academy. So coral can be defined as polytropic organisms that are part of the phylum cnidaria, polytropic meaning that they have multiple methods to obtain their food source. Corals also have a hard skeleton made of calcium carbonate, dark protein, or a combination of both, and these skeletons are often surrounded by microorganisms called zooxanthellae that give the coral their color. So coral, call it, uh, well here's a little graphic I drew to help you visualize the basic anatomy of coral. Uh, coral colonies are often made up of little clusters of living individuals called polyps. These polyps are made up of two tissue layers surrounding a thin gelatinous matrix that contains various different cells. They include a ring of tentacles around the mouth of the polyp. If you look at the diagram, the little white line in the middle of the pink coral is an axis. It's an internal structural structure that supplies support for corals in the orders Gorgonace Gorgonacea and Penatulsia. And another similar axial structure that can be found in corals would be the rachi, which you can see in the or orange sea pen looking picture. There are also two main kinds of polyps, autozoids, which are a feeding coral, and siphonozoids, which produce internal water circulation. As I previously stated, shallow water coral have tiny singular celled algae that live inside them called zooxanthellae. And these are found in shallow water coral reefs and corals because there's plenty of light for them to produce photosynthesis. Um, they can be found alongside nematocysts, sorry, uh, which are stinging structures or organelles within the cells known as cnidocytes, which are in the epidermis of the cnidaria. Alrighty, here's a picture of a SEM or scanning electron microscope image of sclerites. Sclerites are these tiny skeletal elements made of calcitic spikes that provide mild support for coral and Every coral has a different sclerite or different kinds of sclerites, so they are they vary so much that they are often used as key identifiers to identify and organize and categorize new species of coral. So there are five main different kinds of coral, octocorals, hydrocorals, hard corals, black corals, and gold corals. The ones that my research focused on this summer was octocorals, which include soft corals, sea fans, sea whips, and sea pens. So octocorals are the largest group of coral, making up 64% of all coral species. They are named for their eight pinnate tentacles that you can see in that picture on the left, on the far left with the green coral. Um, 
So octocorals are not reef building corals, but instead they exist as individual colonies. In fact, reef building corals only make up 15% of all coral species. So coral and coral reefs can be found in all oceans across the globe, but there are two regions in which coral diversity is highest. Those would be the Indo-Pacific and the Coral Triangle. The Indo-Pacific is a region that covers the Indian and Pacific Ocean where marine biodiversity is at its highest. And the second is Coral Triangle, which is found in the Pacific Ocean. The triangle can be drawn with the Philippines in the north, Papua New Guinea in the east, and Indonesia in the west. It is most common to collect specimens from these regions because that's where biodiversity is the highest. Um, however, our coral species were collected right here off the coast of California, specifically from the Cordell Banks, Greater Fairlands, and Monterey Bay Marine Sanctuaries. A combination of the location as well as the great depths that these corals were found at make it hard to find multiple of the same species. So the coral specimen in this project focused mainly on subtidal and baffle zone in the ocean. So most large coral, coral reefs are found in the intertidal region because there is plenty of sun for photosynthesis. Um, and coral that live in the zones, in these zones tend to produce, reproduce via photosynthesis and um, that's how they get their food source. Um, however, the coral that we focused on are in the bathal and subtidal zones, like I said before. And especially in the bathal zones, they, we reach depths from 200 to 2,000 meters deep. And these off, there is a very intense pressure at these depths that limit the amount of human activity that can go on down there. So we often use remotely operated vehicles to collect our specimen. And that's just one of the cool things that I'd like to highlight about Gary's research is that he is one of the few handful of scientists that is focusing on deep sea coral because most scientists focus on the intertidal or subtidal coral because that's where all the coral reefs are located and that's where you see the bright colorful corals that you think of when you think of coral. But really there is not much known about the deep sea and so it's really cool to be a part of discovering kind of new species and learning more about them. So here are a couple of pictures of the species of interest that I studied in my project. If you look at the middle one on the top row, that is Gersemia Julia Picardi. And the, let's say, the bottom row right hand side, the one that looks like a spiky gumball, that's Heteropolypus ritteri. So I'm just going to tell you a little bit about each family of octocorals. And again, these aren't all the families of octocorals, um, but these are just kind of the ones that I focused on and the, one that we, the ones that we know the most about right now. And most of these have elongated colonies that are thin and whip-like, and the rakes are bilat have bilateral symmetry. So the first family is family Funicillinidae. It's a hard word to say. Um, one of the ways to tell the different Funicillinidae species apart is the difference in the colonies. For example, F. armata have rigid colonies and no coils, while F. parkeri colonies are slender, flexible, and are coiled. And these can be found at depths from 60 to 2600 meters deep and are found in the Indo-Pacific, Eastern Pacific, Mediterranean, and Atlantic Ocean. The next family is family Prototilidae. The colonies of the Prototilidae family are described as slender and long and whip-like. They do have an axis that runs all the way through the colony and these are often found from 650 to 4,300 meters deep in the Indo-Pacific region. Next family is family Anthotilidae. There are only nine described species of Anthotilidae at the moment. Um, and unlike the previous species, these Anthotilidae have sclerites, the little tiny skeletal structures. 
only inside the ovals of the stalk, which is kind of unusual for coral because normally sclerites can be found throughout the entire um, body. And these are found at 150 to 3150 meters deep, specifically in the Indo-Pacific and Atlantic and Arctic or oceans. The next family is family Umbelidae. It is um, the family Umbelidae is clustered polyps that form long slender colonies. They have a round axis that runs throughout the entire colony and they are typically found from 210 to 6,260 meters deep in the Atlantic, Pacific, Indian, and Arctic oceans. And the next family is family Heliteridae. They have polyp leaves that are on mature colonies only, and they are found from 36 to 1950 meters deep, specifically in the Atlantic, Pacific, and Indian Ocean. These will only be the last families, I promise. Um, the family Virgilidae is a round axis family that runs along the colonies and they are found, oh sorry, they have polyps that are short and the rachi are densely arranged and they are found as deep as 1,020 meters and are one of the few families that are found right here off the coast of California. And the very last family is family Cophobelluminidae, it's a long word, <laughs> colonies uh, in this family are elongated, cylindrical, or slightly clavicle, slightly clavate, or short, stout, and distinctly clavate. They have thin round axes or um, slightly quadrangular axi, and they can be found from 36 to 4,400 meters deep. Now, um, there are a couple of methods that I use to analyze and collect our data. Um, we used, like I mentioned before, remote control vehicles, known as ROVs, to collect the specimens, and we use the program software R to analyze the data. So our specimens for this project were com collected for two, from two different expeditions. One was the EV Nautilus, and the other the RV Fulmar and FSV Bell M. Shimada. Both of these expeditions used remotely operated vehicles and these ROVs are designed to withstand the intense pressures of the deep sea that the human body cannot, which I personally think is really cool. Um, and as the name suggests, these vehicles are operated remotely um, by scientists either on shore or on um, the boat. And they are equipped with a camera and a light as well as containers to hold and collect the specimen and they have a robotic arm or a suction cup-esque arm to slurp up the specimen that they are collecting. Also, they have two little laser pointers that are approximately a, me a millimeter wide to help you kind of to act as like a ruler in the deep ocean because as you can imagine, a regular stick ruler doesn't work. Um, and that's often how they read approximate length for the species that we collect. So there are a couple of issues with using an ROV and robotic arm to capture new species, especially in the deep sea. Um, when scouring the deep sea, corals are not often clustered together like they are in coral reefs, but instead they are spread out quite sparsely. Um, and so often when you find a species, it's like the only coral around. And currently at the moment, um, we are collecting those species by using the robotic arm to pick them up and then put them in the collection box of the ROV. Um, however, we don't know if this is the only species that exists. Um, so we could essentially be making a species go extinct by collecting and harvesting them for our research, which is not the greatest. <laughs> um, another thing is that when we use these robotic arms, they do break parts of the um, coral. As you can see from the pictures, they aren't the softest looking things. Um, so if we could, go, moving forward, it would be better to find solutions that were less um, 
brash or harsh for the coral and if we could find ways to minimize the amount of the coral species that we need, that would be great. So um, this is the data that we collected and this graph is um, one I coded myself using R. The data we collected is based off of a preliminary sampling and is by no means complete. Um, and I know at first this graph may look a little bit hard to read, but actually it's quite simple. Um, the graph portrays the depths of all the taxons that we studied for this project. And I have color coded the species based off the family they occur at, um, which the family legend is on the right hand side of the graph. And there are several families that are known as deep sea coral families, including Chrysogorgidae, Promonidae, Isididae, and Prototilidae. And if you'll look at the graph for a second, um, some of these specific species, like Radicipes stony, which is part of the Chrysogorgidae family, these can be found from approximately 2,000 to 2,650 meters deep, while some of the species were only found in one location, which is where you will see the dots like Virgil Virgiluaria, Ooh, hard words. Um, and in the case that you see one dot, it's because we only found one of that species at one depth, so we only had one measurement to put down. Um, so I just like to point out some other things on this graph. As you can see, Keratosis sp, Heteropolypus ritteri, a canella sp and radicipes stony are the deepest species that we found and heteropolypus ritteri was the largest range of depth out of all the species being at the very bottom of the slide um, there are also only about eight species that were only found at one depth so again those are the ones that have just one point so moving forward, there are multiple questions that we still need to answer and more research that needs to be done about the deep sea coral. There is very little known about them right now and there, because of the intense pressure and limited technology, it is often hard to collect new species and specimen. That's why it's really cool that Gary is doing his research specifically in deep sea coral because they are so sparse. Um, and again, a lot of these species that I mentioned earlier have just been found in the past three years or so. Um, and so pretty much nothing is known about them. We don't know how old they are, where they came from, um, how they feed, how they get their color. So there are a lot of questions that can be asked in future research. And I hope to be part of that future research that's done on deep sea coral. So i just like to take a moment to thank Gary Williams for putting together such a great project this summer, despite all the setbacks we face with COVID-19. And I'd like to thank him for all his help throughout this process. I would also like to thank, thank my fellow SSI interns because they have all become really good friends of mine. And I think it was super cool meeting such a diverse group of fellow scientists that are just, just so awesome. Um, I'd also like to thank Lauren Esposito and Rebecca Johnson for putting together this whole REU and despite the COVID setbacks that we had, still being able to pull it off and making it the most memorable summer I'll ever have. And I'd like to thank Gio, like you said earlier, and Sarah for teaching our systematic classes because I truly learned the most and I wouldn't have been able to create my graph in R without Gio. Alrighty. And that's all I have. Any questions? Do we have any questions? Yeah, I have a question. Um, how do you balance, as you said, like the risks and the damages associated with balance or with collecting corals, with the need to collect them in order to understand and to protect them? And how do you weigh those two things? So I personally haven't had to weigh those two things because I wasn't part of the collection process, but I can imagine that it's something that the scientists think a lot about because we don't want to extinct any of these species. Um, so I know that they are working on ways to take smaller parts of the species um, that will still give you just as much DNA, just as much data as taking the entire colony. Um, I think there is kind of like 
a give and take when we do harvest these species from deep sea because like I said, we don't know how often these species exist because they're not all in a coral reef. They're all sparsely spread out. Um, so, I mean, there are pros and cons to it, but at the moment, taking the whole plant is what we have. <laughs> Okay, we have a question from Peter, um, and Peter would like to know, is 2650 meters the limit of the sampling depth? And if so, could some of those deepest species therefore actually range deeper than what you recorded? So for my research, that is the deepest, um, but there have been species found as far as 6,800 meters deep, um, so significantly deeper. Um, that was one species of black coral I know. But for my research, yes, that's as deep as it goes. And one more question from Gio, uh, who is wondering if their depth ranges are undergoing changes now or if they might do so in the future. So we actually don't know a whole bunch about them. Um, I can't say specifically, yeah, like I can't answer that question specifically because there is just so much unknown. Um, and we just found these species in the last three years. So on that expedition was where we actually collected these specimen. Um, and we are just now getting to researching them and answering some of these questions. So unfortunately at the moment, I can't give you a straight answer, but I hope to in the future. And we'll hand it over to Rebecca to introduce our next speaker. All right, um, great job, Jasmine. Thank you so much. Um, our next speaker is um, Arya Nadajaran. And I, before I introduce um, Arya's talk, I wanna um, tell you all a little bit about um, her position and her role this year. So um, this year was the first year during SSI that we had social media interns and um, Aria and Noah were our social media interns and did an amazing job telling stories about the SSI um, to the public. Um, so the first thing that they, well, they launched two um, Twitter handles, Twitter um, accounts, um, one in Spanish and one in English. And they also launched um, Instagram accounts. And the first thing that they did is they worked together with their peers um, to have their peers, their fellow interns, tell their stories about their research. And they had a whole YouTube channel that was called SSIP, kind of like SSI shelter in place. Um, and it was just an incredible way for the students to share their research and to practice um, communicating their science to the public. Um, one of the goals that Lauren and I have for the, the SSI is not only that our students do research over the summer, but they learn science communication skills because as 21st century natural history museum scientists, we don't just do research, we communicate with the public on many different platforms. So having these social media interns not only improve the science communication skills of those interns, Aria and Noah, but um, improve the science communication skills of their fellow interns. And those two interns were uh, mentored by Laurel Allen, who's actually running this live stream right now. Um, and it was a really great partnership with her to figure out how to incorporate these students into the program and to make it meaningful for all of them. Um, in addition, we were supported by other science communication staff at the academy or even during shelter in place. Um, Cassie um, from our public programs department gave a workshop to the students and Katie from our science communication, our writing team also gave a writing workshop to the students. So it's been a really great experience. Um, Laurel's gonna drop the, the links to all the social media channels um, that Aria and Noah developed um, in the chat. I encourage you to check them out. But now after a small technical difficulty, you guys got a little background on our program. Um, we're gonna hear from Aria. Um, and so like I said, she worked with Laurel this summer. She goes to UC San Diego. She also is a veteran of a um, teen program, a teen science communication program that's run here at the Academy. Um, and her talk is entitled The Symbiologist, Examining the Power of Science Communication Through Narrative Storytelling. Take it away, Aria. Cool, thanks, Rebecca. So I know we're probably all sitting at home or in our case here, sitting in the room, but I'd like you all to imagine that you're walking on a beach, enjoying your afternoon, planning to catch a sunset, when you see this. Um, this is a gigantic shark 
it's stranded upside down on the shores as the waves are kind of lapping at its side. And it's not moving at all. Like, is it dead? Maybe just super exhausted from being out of the water for so long? But in any case, when you move slightly closer, you can see there's something kind of weird hanging from its eye. And this weird thing is a copepod, which is a tiny marine crustacean, like crabs, lobsters, shrimps, things that a lot of people eat. Um, and copepods come in a lot of different shapes and sizes, and they live in practically every aquatic environment. This is a special copepod, though. Um, so far, it's only been documented to be living on the eyeball of Greenland sharks, aka the large beached animal that we just met a second ago. And so the copepod and the shark are in a form of a symbiotic relationship, which basically means that they have a physically close set of long-term biological interactions. Like they're always together, they interact together as time goes on. And in this case, that symbiosis is classified as parasitism, since the copepod harms this shark's vision by digging into the cornea with its tiny little claws and causing pretty bad scarring. And I think sharks are great, but my own interest in biology definitely lies more on the side of the tiny things. And when I was going down a bunch of rabbit holes searching for information about this copepod, I found way more coverage on the shark than I did on the copepod itself. And so I started thinking about how the tiny things around us can sometimes be the most difficult to get people excited about, um, in the same way that we kind of get excited about these big, charismatic, mysterious sharks. And we don't always understand the tiny things, we can't really perceive them with our human senses, and, you know, like this lack of understanding is kind of just because there is there are so many tiny things in the world around us and so it's an ongoing process to kind of understand them and so this element of mystery in science can be tough to get people on board with mystery forever exists as like a product of the scientific method because as we learn more we keep on asking new questions and so <laughs> like i said when it comes to the greenland shark we know very little about its eyeball passenger and there are lots of you know, informal science literature that talks about how the understanding of science and teaching that understanding of science needs to come along with an understanding of the scientific process and not just teaching a body of scientific knowledge. And basically, what I'm trying to say here is that it's super key that we embrace the unknown, we embrace the mystery, and ultimately convey that excitement about it through science communication. And so I'm on the search for ways to get people invested in some of the more traditionally difficult science concepts like mystery and such with narrative storytelling as my method of choice. So can narrative storytelling help people engage with these smaller, stranger, mysterious worlds? And so there are a lot of children's books and media geared towards younger learners that accomplish this successfully. And a classic example is the Magic School Bus. You know, you got Miss Frizzle who dives into the human body, gastrointestinal tract, um, outdoor ecosystems, and more. But a lot of the science-related writing that older audiences consume tend to include news articles and maybe popular science books, but not so much creative nonfiction like The Magic School Bus. So I started writing The Symbiologist to explore this niche. And The Symbiologist is a series of stories that follow uh, Tara Anand. She's an emerging scientist and explorer. And the quote you see here is a central theme that the Greenland shark story from her eyes explores. Um, and it's kind of questioning this nature of the shark copepod relationship. Like, is it actually parasitic? And that's kind of one of the central questions of it. And I also started like an appendix in the form of a newsletter to send out additional fun facts. Basically, I went down a lot of rabbit holes working on this project and I just had a lot of things that I wanted to share. So um, anyways, Tara is a fictional character, but she is somewhat a map of my own experiences as a woman of color in science and all of her first hand experiences with these tiny organisms and all their ecological functions are drawn from real world incidents and maintain full scientific accuracy. And so I was kind of hoping to create this personal character and open the black box of science and kind of humanizing it through these firsthand experiences and change the story of who gets to do science and who's at the forefront of scientific endeavors since science is fundamentally for everybody. And so one of the most recent topics I tackled was microscopic algae. And I created these sketches of something known as the red rust, which is a parasitic algae called Cephalurus varescens that eats through a bunch of food producing trees in tropical farming areas. And kind of another central challenge going hand in hand with that mystery challenge is getting people invested in these bigger causes through flagship things that may not necessarily be the most inherently interesting, like algae and agriculture or carbon emissions and climate change and maybe a virus and a pandemic. Um, but this algae is microscopic, but it's also a really great vehicle for telling stories about seemingly static life that exists all around us. And so these are some of the brainstorming sketches that I did while I was trying to figure out how to create a really 
charismatic character out of this algae without sensationalizing it too much and really leaning into descriptive and sensory language in order to create like something that is compelling out of something that is so, so tiny. Um, and so throughout this summer, I kind of drafted this handful of narratives around real science and I needed to test how effective they actually were. So I returned to my shark and copepod story and asked two key questions. The first being, does narrative storytelling help general information stick better? And the second was, does narrative storytelling help readers grasp trickier concepts, some of the more difficult ones? Um, so to test these questions, I circulated two surveys that contained the exact same sets of questions and through them linked participants to two different articles, one from the symbiologist that I wrote and another from a source article that I drew from when writing my piece that contained all the same basic information. So I collected 93 responses, or sorry, 93, 89 responses to survey A and 109 responses to survey B. And this made for a total of 198 survey responses. And there were four different types of questions. There were framing ones that were kind of generally testing what readers saw as the central focus of the piece. There were um, easy, medium, and difficult questions as well. And all of these were designed with the next generation stand set science standards in mind, which I can circle back to later, but um, that's kind of how what I used to create the different difficulty levels. And so I generally wrote symbiologist pieces targeted towards an older audience, but we got a lot of responses from undergraduates, high school students, graduate students, working professionals, kind of a mix. Um, and out of that, a lot of participants did say that they engaged with long form writing pretty frequently, but there were some that also said they didn't. And similarly, um, a lot of folks said that they did engage with biology-related media, um, ranging from lectures to articles to podcasts, and some of them also said that they didn't. Um, so let's dive into some of the actual results here. The first question is kind of a framing one, and you can see, looking at these results, that in terms of accuracy to what both the articles were about, um, people did a really good job of picking out these central focuses of the articles. And the interesting thing about this is that for the symbiologist article, when asked what the central focus was, people picked out copepods, parasites, and Greenland sharks as key players, um, kind of like showing how there might be some kind of like relationships um, that can be shown better through narrative that weaves them together. And here's another similar framing question just to see how people perceived Oelangata, which is the name, the scientific name of the copepod. And overall, people were Again, pretty much accurate to the exact information given through each article. But interestingly, some people put down mutualist as a response in survey A, which kind of shows the sensitivity to the idea that there is still more to know about the type of relationship between the copepod and the shark. Like I mentioned earlier, this is kind of a central theme of the story, so people did pick up on that. And to kind of address that first key question of whether information sticks better, um, this graph shows overall reading comprehension by question type and we're thinking about comprehension in terms of right questions. And generally people performed about equally well per question with both articles. Um, and one thing that narrative could probably stand to improve, I realized, is conveying scale. And it was actually a little bit less effective than the control article on capturing the relative size of the shark. But the narrative did do a little bit better with conveying some of the more open-ended hypothesis parts of the story. Um, with this particular response talking about whether the copepods are bioluminescent or not, it was a little bit clearer and people were able to grasp it a little bit better with the symbiologist article. So thinking back to that second question of whether narratives help trickier information stick, um, how did readers perform on those easier versus harder questions? So as we see here, um, readers of the two different articles did almost exactly the same on average with both easy and medium level questions. But with the harder level questions, readers actually did 8.7% better on um, the, uh, the symbiologist article. And so these are early, fi early findings with only a few hundred responses. But what is really interesting is that it could point to the potential of narrative writing moving forward. And what we do know is that, as we see, narrative writing definitely isn't worse. Um, and so the fact that <laughs> there is like a little bit of difference when it comes to those more difficult questions to grasp is pretty exciting because it's kind of the point of focus of, you know, like we want to communicate those harder things in order to share science in a more comprehensive way. So summing it up, narrative storytelling is no less effective overall and possibly more effective in communicating those complex topics. And overall, narrative writing is 
successful at describing relationships, providing that big picture context, and conveying those open questions really clearly. And moving forward, some things to work on are scale, size, and also hierarchy of information and kind of showing people what is the main point of the story and what are facts and what are still ongoing hypotheses that we're still kind of testing and figuring out. And so I'm building out several new stories to release throughout the next year and going back to these findings to sharpen them and test them. And hopefully you'll see the symbiologist in print one of these days. But um, until then, this is where you can find it. And overall, I came away with a much better understanding of why it's important to write science stories to be sensory and personal and process focused. And going back to those next generation science standards, um, it's really important to share the why we care and how we do it parts of science in a compelling way in order to best communicate that science is this dynamic process and not a static body of knowledge. And yeah, so it was kind of a science in itself to dive into all of this, and I bugged a lot of people with questions. So thank you so much to my advisor, Laurel, for reading through my terrible first drafts and helping me make them better and sending me inspirational tweets along the way. Um, and a humongous thank you to our program directors, Drs. Lauren Esposito and Rebecca Johnson, for first of all making SSI happen during a literal pandemic, and second of all creating an environment in which I've seen myself grow and learn so much. Um, and yeah, huge thanks to all the other advisors that I bothered with questions and those of you who helped me with my R graphs and literally just, you know, listening to me blab about my project and I'm beyond grateful to have had this chance to be sound surrounded by such incredible, brilliant people. And yeah, thanks for listening. Questions? <laughs> That would be me. <laughs> yeah, so um, these are some of the cover images that I drew for um, uh, some of the stories that I wrote. And I just really like to draw, so I, I just kind of did it. Um, but yeah, yeah, that was me. <laughs> um, I have a question. Um, are, so are you saying then in this that uh, the narrative writing actually help people understand more about the interconnectedness and sort of big picture than just straightforward articles? From these early findings, yes. Um, like I said, it is still early findings, so it's kind of one of those things where I can definitively say that people <laughs> did it was like narrative writing was no less effective. But um, there, like to answer that question, I think in some cases people may have done better in seeing those connections uh, just because of the way that the symbiotic relationships in the shark copepod story were presented as so interwoven. Um, to be fair, the other article did kind of show, it, like they focused very clearly on the shark and kind of mentioned the copepod and there was a mention of a relationship, but like I said, when I was searching for pieces to you know, satisfy my curiosity about the copepod, um, I didn't really find any and was kind of aiming to create this interwoven story about both of them together. Yeah. Uh, and there's a question from Laurel. Did your first batch of survey results make you think about other questions that you'd want to ask or questions that you'd ask differently? Yeah, uh, definitely. Um, hmm, let me see. Yeah, when it comes to like uh, the, I think, focus of the piece questions, like those early framing questions, I, I kind of realized when I was looking through my results, like I wish I had framed this a little bit differently and asked people what they thought were the biggest takeaway is just kind of straight up um, to see like a little bit clearly how they did perceive those, you know, like we were talking about the relationships between organisms and stuff like that. But it's definitely a process for me to kind of figure out what are the best questions to ask people to understand their understanding. Um, yeah, yeah. Uh, and a couple other sort of related questions coming from from YouTube. The first is, do you think your findings suggest that college classes should use more narrative stories versus textbooks for or textbooks that are written more narratively for better learning? Hmm, that's a really good question. Um, as a college student myself, I think I'd love that. I, don't, <laughs> I think, um, you know, like I'm, I'm personally a big fan of narrative storytelling and these findings that I worked on this summer as well as some of the other kind of like learning education literature that I've read do really emphasize narrative as a positive thing in storytelling and like, I keep saying the same thing over and over again, but show, like seeing that narrative storytelling is no less effective than traditional science communication 
kind of does, I think, suggest that it is a worthwhile thing to see how narrative kind of plays into college formal education and things like that because it doesn't seem to take away from anything, um, especially if it is done very intentionally and you know put together with that purpose of conveying bigger picture themes in mind. And similarly, um, Manuel asks, so do you think then that researchers should develop their narrative storytelling skills? Yes, <laughs> that's that's a that's a hundred percent from me. Absolutely. I think it's also just kind of, you know, like science is such a fun thing and researchers know that. And a lot of people who are trying to go into research know that know that. But um, it's not something that I think is super clear, especially like when you're growing up and you're like, oh, my science class boring, like they're just, you know, teaching us things out of this book, but this emphasis on the process and like narrative and creating your own story, I think is something so important that as researchers um, do their work can kind of like share with people. It just makes it all more fun. Like big fan of making things more fun. Um, and Skylar asks, was there a difference in article length between the narrative and non-narrative pieces? That's a really good question. Um, they were pretty close in word count. Um, I think they were both around a thousand something words. Um, so I'd have to go back and double check that, but they were they were pretty close. And from Allison, did you look at respondents' academic level or interaction with science writing versus how they answered the questions? You know, that's actually one of the future questions that um, I wanted to answer, and I'm flipping back here through these pie charts. So yeah, like this is kind of the summary of academic levels, but um, I would really love to look at how this kind of correlates with the actual correctness of response. So this compared with this, uh, I think would be a really, really interesting thing to look at and see if there's any you know, potential to really teach people of non-biology backgrounds more about the scientific process through narrative, for sure. Uh, and actually, a, a really similar question from Katie, which is just that, have you noticed any similarities between narrative storytelling and the scientific method itself? Ooh, that's a great question. I love that one. Um, I think so. Like as somebody who's coming from a biology background, but has also done a lot of like art and writing throughout my life, I think the reason that I do love science so much is because it is kind of like, <laughs> like, you know, creating that story and, um, you know, it kind of goes both ways where like throughout this process of drafting narratives about science, I, I did have to like do a ton of research and kind of draw out those big picture conclusions and then ask more questions and kind of search for the answers to those questions. And um, yeah, I think this like process of questioning is, is what kind of unites the two and narratives do have like, or science does have a similar arc to like narratives where you have your setup and then you have your um, kind of like conflicts that you're looking into and then your final results, which are kind of your resolution and things like that. So, so yeah, definitely. <laughs> Okay, thanks again to Aria and over to Rebecca to introduce our next speaker. Thanks so much, Aria. Um, it was so fun to learn about your research. I look forward to chatting more about it. Um, our next speaker is Ian Schreiner, who joins us from Earlham College. And Ian worked with a team of researchers. I'm going to mention them all here. He, he worked with Darrell um, and Jack, Darrell Capon and Jack Dumbacher, who are Academy um, <laughs> scientists. And he also worked with um, Pat Manley from the U.S. Forest Service, um, Mary Clapp from UC yeah. Davis, and Tom Denton and Mary Matt Harvey from Google. And um, that team makes sense when you see the, hear the title of his talk, which is Machine Learning and Autonomous Recording Units Analysis of a New Tool for Bird Monitoring. Take it away, Ian. All right. So as Rebecca said, uh, my name is Ian Schreiner. And this summer, I researched machine learning and automated recording units. Um, which are new tools available to scientists to study birds. And this research stems from an ongoing project at Cables Creek, which is located in the Sierra Nevada mountains just east of San Francisco. And it's a project that's a collaboration between the U.S. Forest Service and the California Academy of Science, with my advisors, um, to study how the forest responds after a prescribed burn. So last fall, the Cables Creek watershed was prescribed burned. And my research team wants to know, how did that burn change the forest? Is it the same forest as it was before? And specifically, we're trying to answer that question by measuring bird biodiversity. Um, so we began surveying the breeding bird population every summer starting back in 2017. Uh, so we have three years of pre-burn data, and we're getting post-burn data now. And 
Um, out of that, there's also another question, and that's the question I'm looking at, which is not so much the bird response to the fire, but the way that we're measuring um, the bird community. And so we're using two methods, point counts and AOU recorders. And I'll introduce both of these briefly. Oh, here's a photo of the fire. Um, so point counts, point counts are the current standard for measuring bird communities. And to conduct a point count, a researcher observes a point for a set amount of time, usually three to 10 minutes, and we record every bird species uh, that we observe. And every point count takes place in a window of time in the morning when the birds are most active. So for us, that was between 5.45 and 9.15 a.m. And it's a really good method, but it has some notable drawbacks. Uh, most significantly, it is difficult to scale up. You know, a single experienced researcher can only make it to so many points. And you can see here in, in the slide, there's a map of our study area. And we had 82 points out in a 10 square mile area. And so it took a lot of effort to get to all those points. And so then there's another tool called an automated recording unit, or an ARU. And these are small recorders that can be placed out in the study area, and they're set to record the ambient sounds on a set schedule. So we set ours to record 50 minutes on, and then turn off for 15 minutes, uh, and continue doing that between 4 p.m. and 10 o'clock. And the huge advantage of ARUs is that they're much easier to scale. So you can hike out to a point, leave an ARU there, and just let it do its thing for days, hike out and get it in uh, a week or so. And so in doing so, they can collect so much more information than it's possible to get with point counts. But of course, the problem with that is scaling means you get a lot of data. So last year in a single short field season, we collected 3,561 hours of sound data. That's a lot of data. <laughs> So if I was to work nonstop for 40 hours a week, it would take me over two years to listen to that data, let alone stopping and identifying each sound. And so this is where machine learning comes in and works really well with ARUs. And that's the question I'm trying to answer, is we want to know, can we use a machine learning program along with the ARU data to measure bird populations the same way we can with point counts? And the benefit of doing so would be the ability to significantly scale up uh, the size of studies and be able to process these enormous amounts of data that we couldn't look at otherwise. And AOUs are continuing to be deployed more and more around the world, so there's more and more data that's available out there that no one can do anything with right now, and machine learning could be a way to look at that data. There are some problems, of course, yet to be solved, or, and that's the process we're in now. So um, AOUs and machine learning, they lack the human insight. It requires really good training data. And it also requires a significant amount of computing power, not to mention you know, the knowledge and know-how to make a machine learning program. And so we're really fortunate to be working right now with a great team at Google who have made this machine learning program that I was able to look at the data from as part of my project this summer. So how does the machine process work? And I'm no expert on this, but I'm going to give a brief overview of our steps. And that begins with us coming up with the 79 species that we thought would be reasonable to be found at Capels. And we sent that over to Google, and they used the data that was available in Xenocanto, which is essentially like an online library of bird sounds that's available from uploads that community members uh, uploaded. And so we used that, or they used that, I should say, at Google, to create a machine learning program that could distinguish the sounds between the different species. And then we sent over our ARU data and plugged it through 2,200 parallel servers. So that's where that massive computing power comes from. And that generated an output. And just to break that down a little bit more, it's kind of a two-step process. The first challenge that the machine learning program has to accomplish is to identify individual sound events. So like this is a vocalization, and it's separate from this vocalization. And then after that, they need to run through and identify which species that vocalized. And so this is the output that comes out of that process. It's this table. If you imagine that the table is actually 79 columns wider, one for every species, and 1.6 million observations long, one for every sound event over those 3,000 hours. And so obviously, I could not scroll through that by hand. I would still be doing that if so. So I took a slightly less time intensive, but still an immersive experience this summer, to plug that into R, a software program, and to use uh, R to kind of figure out which species that was being identified for each sound. So I said, the number that uh, the machine plugs out is called a logit, and that's sort of the most the likelihood or the confidence that that 
sound belongs to each species. And so I've selected which species had the highest logic, what was the most likely species for each sound event, and compared that to what a human annotated manually as identifying that sound event. And that let me answer a few specific questions, because my overall trend question is, can ARUs replace point counts? But I broke that down into a few specific questions to kind of begin the process of teasing out the answer to that bigger question. So the first thing I want to know is, when we conduct a point count, we identify birds by sight as well as by sound. And AOUs don't have eyes. So I want to know, does that matter? Does the lack of visual observations affect the AOU data? And the second thing I wanted to know was, for every sound event that um, the machine program identified, how many were correct, how many were wrong? Um, and the third thing was, even if not every event was correct, was overall, if given a length of recording, would the, same, would the machine program generate the same list of species as generated by a human? And if not, which species will require additional training? So I started off by looking at our point count data. And this is a pie chart showing the proportion of point counts that a given species was identified solely by sound, solely by sight, and then by a mix of the two. And as you can see, visual-only observations make up a very small portion. It's about 3% in the gold color. Um, and so that's good. That's promising. But it does matter if it's biased towards certain species. So the next thing I did was break this down by species. And this next figure on the x-axis, you can see uh, the different species. And the y-axis is the percent of observations of each species that were visual only. Um, so most of them, uh, all but nine, were actually identified by visual only, less than 1%. But there were a few uncommon species that were identified much higher. For example, uh, you can see the Calliope hummingbird and the turkey vulture on the far left, both of which were actually only identified by sight in our point counts. And this makes sense as both species are not common vocalizers. And this is something that's really important for us to consider when using the results of machine learning. You know, some rare or quiet species may end up underrepresented. But that said, we can counterbalance this by having many hours of recordings. Our point counts are short 10 minute bursts and we have about three per count or per point and this can be balanced by having many hours of ARU recording so I put on the top of the the columns you can see the number of times they were detected in a point count and calliope hummingbirds were detected twice and turkey vultures once and so um, they're really really rarely detected and so by increasing the amount of time we're out trying to detect that species we can increase how often we detect them so for my next question, I compared the Google sound events to the matching human identified annotations. And once again, this figure has species on the x-axis. And the y is the number of events that they were identified by Google. So the number of different sounds that Google said is this species. And I color coordinated it by the ones that matched with the Raven human ID um, and the non-human ID. And so most species, most of the common species at least, were a mix of correct and incorrect answers with some variety. For example, um, there's one you can see in the mix of the more common species, the common night hawk is almost entirely blue. So it was almost entirely identified correct. And there's also more in the center, a tall column of all red, where um, the black-throated gray warbler is almost entirely misidentified. And so this kind of result gives us a better sense of where is the machine program struggling and where is it doing well. But this isn't um, really answer everything we want to know. Because when we look at this, it's just looking at event. And like I said earlier, it's OK if you don't catch it the first time you hear it, as long as you catch it eventually. So if you imagine when I'm out point counting, if I hear a new sound, and I don't know what the species is that first time, but I hear it a second time and I get it, it's OK because the species is represented. Um, but before I show you that last figure, I want to kind of introduce a concept about sensitivity and specificity. And so this is kind of deciding what, um, how restrictive we want to be in regards to our confidence in our identification. So if we want to go for really high specificity on the left here, we can be really confident that only species that are right are being included in our detections. But by that, that opens up us to risk that we're going to miss species that were also present and we didn't detect. And on the other hand, we can move over on the spectrum to the right and have high sensitivity where we're sure that we got everything that was there. But by doing so, by expanding out like that, we're likely to get some incorrectly detected species. So species that we said were there, 
but weren't actually. And so our goal is to find that sweet spot in the middle where we have the least false detections of either sort. And to look at that, I produced this figure. And the x-axis is, once again, species. And this time, the y-axis shows the proportion of times, um, the proportion of five-minute intervals that each species was identified. And I broke it into four categories. So there's white and blue on the top is when Google and human annotations both agreed. So white means they were both agreed that the species was not there. Blue means that they both agreed the species was there. And then the red below means they disagreed. So light red means that the species was there and Google did not detect it. And dark red means that the species was not there, but the machine learning program said it was. And this gives us a clear idea of where the program is at. So we can see some species that the program is overcalling. And you can see on the far right, um, for example, brown creeper has a lot of dark red. So that means that the species is often saying that the species is there when it actually isn't. It's overcalling it. And then we can also see moving over more light red. And these are times when the species are being um, missed by the machine learning program, when they actually are there, but they're not being detected. And so in conclusion, we're not quite ready yet, but this is a really strong first step in the machine learning process. And AOUs and machine learning together represent an area of incredible potential for researchers that can open up a lot more, uh, the ability to really ask larger scale questions. And that's really exciting. So some improvements need to be made, and that's where my research can come in. Um, my research shows which species the machine learning program struggles with the most right now. And we can use this information to improve the program. So one good way to do this would be to add more training data, especially sound data, from, um, and especially sound data from our field work, which will have the same quality and the same background noise patterns as the recordings that we're trying to identify. And we can also look, um, continue to look at patterns in the types of species or the types of vocalizations that the machine is struggling with and adapt to that. And this will really open up a really exciting field going forward. Uh, and now, last thing before I open up to questions, I need to say thank you to a lot of individuals, uh, more individuals than I can fit on this screen. But specifically, I have to call out my incredible advisors, uh, Jack Dumbacker and Darrell Capon who not only guided and supported this entire project that I just presented, but also showed me so much about how to be a good scientist. And of course, also our um, wonderful SSI program leaders, Lauren Esposito and Rebecca Johnson, um, who were able to adapt an incredible internship to the circumstances of a pandemic, as so many others have echoed. And I'm so grateful to their commitment to making this program happen, regard no matter what happened. Um, and I'm also thankful to the incredible group of inspirational speakers and fellow interns who I don't have time to name individually, but who really supported each other throughout this whole process. Um, and of course, to my field and Cropples Creek collaborators, Pat Manley with the Forest Service, Tom Denton and Matt Harvey at Google, and Mary Clapp at UC Davis. So thank you all. And also shout out to the California Academy of Science, of course, and the National Science Foundation for supporting this program. So with that, I'll take an Aiden question. <laughs> yeah. This is a bush tit. And this is actually not from our field site, but I took it a couple of weeks before, and it was so cute that I had to include it as my question slide. Uh, and we have a question from Gio. Uh, mm -hmm. This sounds really terrific work, Ian. Do you have some thoughts on what attributes make some species more recognizable than others via sound? Uh, that's a great question. And I would preface my answer with saying I know very little about the kind of algorithms or what have you about that the machine learning program works. I don't even know if algorithms is the right word. <laughs> um, but I know from my perspective, when I'm looking at sound recordings, some species really jump out as having a distinctive sort of vocalization. And so when we went through to manually annotate the files, we did so with a program that showed the sonogram, uh, which is the, the sound mapped over the frequency and time of the vocalization. And some species have really like unique identifying uh, sound patterns. And so I imagine it's something similar with Google, where certain sounds are more distinctive and differ more dramatically from other species. Uh, and another question, this time from Rebecca, which is wondering, what do you think about adding an iNAT or iNaturalist style community verification step to the identifications that the AI makes? 
Definitely. I think that's a great idea and something that um, my advisors and I have definitely chatted about in the field. Um, I know of a lot of really cool examples of things of like community based um, validation. You know, eBird has a quiz online where you can go and validate or like take quizzes on species, which helps um, validate the species that they have in their digital library. And I think that's a really good way to crowdsource information for sure. And you may have said this when you first introduced it, but Xenocanto, which is where mm -hmm. people I upload the bird sounds into, like where, who's, what community is uploading those bird sounds? Are they professionals or just ordinary citizens? Definitely, that's a great question. Um, it's it's available to anyone. It's a kind of community-based uh, project like iNaturalist for uploading photos, or eBird as well is another one you can upload um, bird photos and recordings. And Xenocanto is a really great one because it's particularly open. Um, a lot of the files that are uploaded there are in an open license, so you can take those and use them for your research or for other uses as whatever it helps. Great, let's thank Ian and let Rebecca answer, introduce the next speaker. Great job, Ian. Thank you so much. Um, next up, we have Michelle Perez Ariola from UC Merced. Her advisor was Manuel Lujan. And um, she will talk with us today about understanding psychis, assembling plastomes to resolve species relationships. You're up, Michelle. Hi, my name is uh, Michelle Prez, and today I will be presenting on understanding psychis, assembling plastomes to resolve species relationships. Um, this summer, I worked on assembling plastomes, obviously, to resolve the species relationships between psychis. And first, what are cycas? Cycas is a genus of plants which have been around for a long time, times dating back to Jurassic and Cretace Cretaceous periods. Uh, cycas take a very long time to grow, and although they've been around for a very long time, the knowledge that we have on them is scarce, which is why I spent my summer contributing to the knowledge the world has on cycas. Um, this summer, I worked with Dr. Manuel Lujan, where my task was to utilize new genomic data based on RAD sequence which is restriction site associated DNA sequencing and previous data in order to assemble the plastome genome of 12 samples from four species of Australian cycads. I then used this data to reconstruct phylogeny phylogenies and resolve species relationships. Um, I had my, the different cycad species labeled on here. From what I can remember off the top of my head was it was, I worked with Cycus teriana, Cycus media, Cycus ophiolitica, and there was another one but I'll show that later in, this, in the slides. Um, also, before moving on, I will briefly explain what a plastome is. Uh, we all know that chloroplast is where photosynthesis occurs, and it has its own genome. That chloroplast genome DNA is called plastomes. So the methods I use um, was a software called Genius, which contains a number of sequence analysis tools, and through the software, I was able to assemble the plastomes. Uh, I first began by uploading the RADSeq data I was working with and mapped that data to a reference. I briefly mentioned earlier that I utilized previous data. This previous data consisted of plastomes that were previously assembled for other species of cycas, not the ones that I was working with in particular, but previous ones. These assembled plastomes served as a reference for the plastomes that I assembled. Um, there were many references for me to choose from, so filtering between uh, which worked best with my species of cycas was where I first started. And on the lower right corner, you can see um, basically what the software looked like and what I was working with. Um, all those folders is the different trials that I first had to run, first narrowing down which reference I should use, and then later narrowing down what sensitivity I should have my laptop at. Um, not only for the, the best sensitivity for the cycas I was working with, but the sensitivity that my laptop can handle. All the work that I did was on my laptop. And Genius is a very uh, heavy software, so as the other interns I lived with can tell, my computer would breathe very loudly when I would be running these programs. And each plastome I assembled took approximately five to six hours, and I worked with I worked with four species and each species had three samples, so altogether it was 12 times that I had to run these programs and obviously the filtering. It was just very heavy on my laptop, so shout out to my laptop for making it through. And then um, I was able to assemble plastomes and ultimately create a phylogenetic tree. There's my tree. 
And um, in our results, we see that some species of cycas were able to form a monophyletic group. This was expected because this means that the plastome data we used is supporting the, mon the monophyletic group. Uh, we also see that some of the species I worked with are recovered as monophyletic, such as Cycus candida, but we, all, we can also see that not all samples were clustered together according to species names, such as Cycus teriana, as you can see in the tree. It is mixed with Cycus ophiolitica, um, rather than all the other Cycus teriana, how we originally expected to see. Um, this is okay, but since we didn't expect to see this, this could be a result of the plastome data that we worked with not being um, enough, informative enough to resolve the relationship between all species of cycas. Um, this is this is okay uh, that to happen. I say the plastome data may not have been informative enough because plastome data evolves extremely slowly. As I say, these are um, slow-growing plants, and their plastome also evolves very slowly. And also factors that could have contributed to the us not seeing this formation of a monophyletic group could be a process of hybridization, which we aren't too familiar with. So um, this kind of, the way this looks is some species may share plastome information, but that is something that we would have to require further research for us to be able to confirm that is true. This is just something that could have been affecting the data that I got. Um, conclusion and future directions. In the future, it would be interesting if we could annotate the plastomes we built by identifying the genes that are in long strands in the DNA. And it would also be interesting to compare the tree we got, the com compare the tree we got and compare it to an analysis made with the entire DNA and not only plastome DNA. As I said, that's what I worked with earlier because uh, that could have provided some limitations. And with using the entire DNA, we could see potential differences. Um, so as I mentioned earlier, plastome data evolves very slowly, so there's no genetic recombination. And in com this is in comparison to the nucleus, which has recombination, which is also way faster. That, so if we use DNA, if we use um, others in instead of just the plastome DNA, then that could be like more broad and help us with our limitations that we saw in this project. So I want to say thank you to Dr. Manuel Lujan because he was really supportive and um, he knows how nervous I was to present today. And he said that he was just always available for me. So I just want to say thank you to that. Also, thank you to Dr. Natalie and Rebecca and Lauren because they allowed me to have this opportunity. And the other intern, all the interns, I didn't put you guys up here, but I'm also thankful for all of you guys. <laughs> and that's, anybody have any questions for me? Any questions from in here? Hi, Angela. Um, what are the differences between side and side uh, oh, What are the differences between side and side Sycas is the scientific name, and side is more of an informal name that you would just kind of like science slang, I would say. <laughs> I have a question, uh, and my question is, what, what was the most surprising outcome of this research? What, like, was there something unexpected, or was, did it all pan out exactly like you thought it would? Um, for me, just the tree as a whole was a surprising outcome, just seeing how everything sorted out, because psychas are very understudied, and um, so just being able to contribute to this and seeing how these relationships interacted with each other using the plastome data that I used was just interesting to see in itself. And a question from Natalie, how big were your matrices? How what? How big were your data matrices? Like bases? Oh, uh, yeah. Um, they were really, I can't say exactly, I believe 5 million bases. So that's why it was, it was really strenuous on my laptop. And how many tax, remind us how many terminals? It was how many four species of cycas, um, Australian cycas, and each sample had, th each of them had three samples. So 12. Awesome. Really great job. We're going to turn it over to you and let Rebecca introduce the next speaker. Great job, Michelle. Thanks, thank you so much for sharing your work. Um, next up, we have Tom Tran, 
who joins us from UT Austin. Um, and this summer she worked with, Dr. with Lauren Esposito and Aaron Goodman. And she will be talking to us about scorpions, centroides, merging morphological and genome genomic data. Hi y'all, um, I'm Tan Jun, and uh, this summer I worked with Lauren and her grad student Erin studying a genus of scorpions called Centroides, um, and I merged morphological and genomic data. So just kind of an overview of scorpions, um, there's about 2,500 known species. Uh, they're predatory arachnids with eight legs, a set of pedipalps and a segmented tail. They evolved around 430 million years ago during the Silurian period, and their distribution is that they're found on all continents except for Antarctica. Um, so some terrestrial habitats include, you know, like mountains, caves, intertidal zones, and they also occupy microhabitats, so ground dwelling, tree living, rock living, sand living, and so on. Diving deeper into um, the order of Scorpionis is the genus Centroides, and um, they belong to a family that arose 350 million years ago, and there's around 90 known species. And they're found all the way up in southwestern Canada, running down to northern South America and into the Caribbean as well. Something to note is that they're really widely distributed in Mexico. There's a lot of species around 45, including the three species that um, Aaron and Lauren studied, as well as the three species that um, I conducted research on. So uh, for some background into uh, my own work, um, Lauren and Aaron did a, did a study called Niche Partitioning in Congeneric Scorpions. And it was regarding um, these three species of centroroides in the isthmus. Um, specifically in the, the biosphere reserve. And this was the location of a really important diversification event um, where the opening and closing of this isthmus led to the isolation and reunification, um, which again led to um, niche partitioning within these scorpion species. So to summarize a little bit of their findings, to the left, the estimated mean of counts uh, basically illustrates the points that different species were found in different habitat types and um, they're statistically shown to actually occupy these spatial niches. So between pastures, primary forest type, and secondary forest types. And to the right, um, it shows that each particular species had different temperature, habitat, and substrate preferences as well, and that's exemplified in the hypervolume analysis. Um, during this time, Aaron also collected morphological data, so he um, measured different parts of the scorpions, and that morphological data was part of my data structure that went into my project for this summer. So getting into um, my project, my overall question was, that, was if there were morphological characters that are adapted for tree-dwelling scorpions. And my hypothesis is that those adaptations would aid tree dwellers, so Centroides rileyis, in gripping tree trunks and maintaining balance, as well as facilitate niche partitioning. So for Centroides rileyi, which is on the far right, um, since they're tree dwelling, I kind of hypothesize that they might have longer legs to grip the tree trunks or taller crawls just for the same reason. And the, just the overall general goal was to use the morphological data and align it with um, to see if it aligned with the niche differences Aaron found in the field in Mexico. So this is kind of um, a bit of an insight into the data that I used. Um, so the top half of the screen, you'll see some of the measured traits that Aaron thought could be important to their ecology. So some examples were the claw height and the claw length, as well as the leg lengths one through four, and so on and so forth. Um, these measurements were in millimeters, and the chart at the bottom is after we analyzed it a little bit. And um, they are the average values of the measurements Aaron took, and they're organized by the characteristics that are named in the gray rectangles. So going into my data analysis, um, just for an overview of methods, the overall goal was to identify characteristics, if any, um, were statistically different between these three species. So to find which characters are informative of what species by essentially mapping those characters um, on top of um, a phylogenetic tree. So the first step in standardizing morphological measurements, I use carapace length, which scales isometrically with age, um, which means that it grows at a standard pace across all scorpion species. Um, the next uh, step was PCA, um, in which the analysis was to find combinations with the highest amount of variance. 
Um, that basically means that it reduces the amount of variables in a larger data set um, to a smaller set while still containing the most pertinent information. Um, simply put, it kind of makes it easier to analyze with the output of a smaller data set without losing the most important data, po data points. Um, for step three, um, the generalized linear model was just to compare the different outcomes of the PCA, and the two keys test was a series of pairwise comparisons to find um, which characters were most informative by looking at just two species at a time. Uh, the next step was to build the tree of species, which were sequenced from CO1 genes, and these sequences were collected from both infield specimens that Aaron collected in the isthmus, as well as two from Cal Academy's own collection. And finally, um, ancestral character state analysis was combining those two data sets, the tree and the characters we found to be informative through PCA, and was the final step in analyzing the phylogenetic importance of those characters. Uh, so diving into more of like the nitty gritty of the methods, um, to the left, the Tukey test was after I standardized the measurements within the length of t the carapace, and it consists of pairwise comparisons between the scorpion species to indicate if the measurement values were overall significantly different from each other. So we can see um, to the left, uh, under Riley and Flavopictus, the p-value is 0.08, meaning that they're statistically similar when accounting for every type of measurement that was taken. Um, to the right is the ordination biplot, and it's just a way to visualize the orientation of the data points organized uh, by the species type. So between Flavopictus, which are the red circles and the blue circles, you can see a lot of separation, um, which is again reflected in their low p-value in the two key test to the left, which is less than 0 0.001. And most importantly, um, from our PCA outputs, the output with the highest amount of variance, we call it PC1, indicated that leg lengths one through four were informative of the species, and PC2 indicated claw heights, four legs one through four was indicative of species. So the next step was building the tree um, from the sequences in the field and from Cal Academy. And the purpose was to depict the evolutionary relationships, which we then used to assess the phylogenetic importance of the characters we found in the previous analysis. So this is kind of an example of just how we used um, ancestral character state analysis, looking at one measurement type at a time. So looking at leg length one only. So um, this was leg length one after PC2 indicated that it was informative of the species. And um, we performed the character state analysis with this matrix of leg length one and the imported tree as inputs. And this was the output of the color gradiated plot. Um, so to read into this a little bit with Riley eye, uh, at the bottom you can see that the branch tip is a bright red. And you can then know that it sets the leg length one sets it apart from Flavopictus and Gracilis, which are bright blue um, branch tips. Um, because the Flavopictus and Gracilis share the same um, dark blue, those species aren't statistically different using leg length one as a character measurement. So now going into um, pairwise comparisons across all of the um, claw lengths or claw heights and leg lengths, um, we find that evolutionary signal in claw height is much stronger um, when we compare it to um, the signal that we get from leg lengths. So this can be seen in the different branch tips on the left plots. So in those phylogenetic trees on the left side, Gracilis is a dark blue and Flavopictus is a neon green and Rileyi is that really bright red at the bottom. And on the 2D black and white plots, which are the ones to the, the sides of the phylogenetic trees, we see that the indicators of each species, so those black dots, are spatially apart as well, which also indicates statistical difference. And then this is again contrasted by the plot on the right, which compares all of the leg length measurements. And for three out of four of these plots, we can see that Gracilis and Flavopictus aren't statistically different by leg lengths, and their branch tips are both dark blue. Um, jumping into a little bit of discussion and um, future ways that we could take this research, um, one of my questions is if these measurements hold true for the 70-some-odd um, species within Centroroides. So figuring out if these two characters, leg length and claw height, among others that we haven't measured yet, if they're different between Centroroides species and how that could aid in um, the identification both in and outside of the field. Um, a second question is exploring the events of diversification that led to these specific traits arising. So why were these traits significant? Why did they arise? And what advantage does like a longer leg or a taller claw give to that species? For Centroroides riley, maybe it could be that they are able to scale trees 
faster or they're able to stay up in the canopy away from other predators and away from other scorpions because they eat each other or maybe even um, changes in their own center of gravity for different terrains. So scorpions who live in the leaf litter versus tree trunks versus the branches. And then overall, just kind of um, understanding which character traits are significant could just lead to a deeper understanding of why certain character differences arose during those speciation events, including the opening of those isthmus so many millions of years ago. And yeah, so this is my thank you slide. I wanted to thank um, Lauren Esposito and Aaron Goodman for all of their help. They're my mentors, and Aaron helps me so much, especially with the analyzation of all of um, the data. Sarah Cruz for helping me build the tree, and Gio for giving me a crash course in R, and Rebecca for being a coordinator, and then Stitch and Chicha for being great canines. <laughs> and then, of course, all of the SSI intern group, but especially um, those who lived upstairs with me. But yeah, and then these are my sources. Um, so niche partitioning is kind of when um, different scorpi or sorry different species occupy or use their environment in different ways. So with the scorpions, they were doing spatial partitioning, and so they're occupying different temperatures and humidities and even altitudes. And then I know like uh, I know some bird species also occupy different parts of the tree, so they'll you know alight on like the tips of the trees or the middle or the sides. And it's just a way for um, multiple species to coexist when there are like limited resources. Yeah. We have a an, well, it's not a super science related question, but a good question nonetheless, which uh, I think could be from one of your family members, asking how, how, if you know how to say ultraviolet in Vietnamese. Oh my <laughs> oh, it was because I was explaining my my research to my grandma, and she didn't know what ultraviolet meant. <laughs> so I was trying to translate it in Vietnamese, but it didn't work out. Because because um, scorpions glow in the dark when they're um, subject to UV light. <laughs> Uh, I have a question, which is what what do, was the most surprising outcome of this research? Was there anything that was particularly unexpected or that was new to you or like a part of it that was you found the most exciting just in terms of the process? Um, I think the coolest part was learning um, R and when I was working with Aaron, he showed me, I mean, so many different kind of plots and way to, ways to visualize data. Um, both both like 3D and 2D and changing how they look and changing how like easy it, or changing um, uh, the level of understanding based on like how you can visualize the data. So that was definitely something that really caught my attention. Um, when uh, when Gio was teaching his class, I couldn't really see like how like this could be applied to the data. But once I started doing like the nitty gritty of the analyses, it was really satisfying to see all of like my analyzed data points um, result in these really pretty graphs and really informative plots and stuff. So yeah. Uh, we have a question from Toulon asking why did you include specimens from both field and museum collections? Yeah, so um, so while Aaron was in Mexico, he took those species and found those um, CO1 um, genomic sequences. And then I think Lauren, you took some a couple of species from uh, Cal Academy's own collection and that was just to double check to see if he had identified the species correctly because sometimes in the field they might all look the same to you or you might have you know like incorrect identification so when I was making that tree and um, Gracilis or um, Rileyi or Flavopictus aligned with each other in the tree that was just further confirmation that he had gotten the identity of the scorpions right. So. Uh, and another question do you have? Angola which a claw um, is made especially with scorpions so I think it'd be kind of cool to test like what scorpions can grip onto, what like specific um, species can grip onto, and how that plays into how um, effective they are in the ecological niche that they occupy. Yeah. Excellent. Let's thank Don for an awesome talk and Rebecca. Great job, Tom. Thanks so much. So we have one more speaker um, wrapping up like our symposium this afternoon. We have um, Luigi Febre, who's from Haverford College. And this summer, he worked with um, Natalie Nagolingham. 
And the title of his talk is Conservation of Cycads, Understanding Morphological Characteristics. All right, take it away, Luigi. Oh, hey, y'all. Uh, monkey going. All right. Hey, y'all. Uh, my name is Luigi Febres, and I had the honor of working with Dr. Natalie uh, Nagalingam. And so the title of my thing, Conservation of Cycads, Understanding Morphological Characteristics. So here we go. So as my homie, Michelle, working on the other cycads introduced, cycads are super slow growing. So slow growing, like the, basically saying the height is uh, directly related to their age. So the older, the, the taller the cycad, the older they are. And these cycads are dioecious, so which means that they have both a male plant and a female plant, one holding the sperm and the female plant holding the ovules. And they're considered like living fossil plants because like in all the Jurassic Park movies and everything, the ones that look like palms, those are the cycads. And they're called living fossil plants because although they're not the same exact plants that lived during that period, they look exactly alike or super similar to the fossil records. And as you can see here, our wonderful intern, Arya Narajan, made a beautiful infographic of cycads. So, so where are these cycads located? They're found in subtropical to tropical regions, and they grow in semi-desert to rainforest climates. And as you can see, they're all over the world, as you see, and I have focused on specifically on cycads. And cycads is pretty wide distributed from South Asia to Southeast, all the way to Australia. So cycads taxonomy. They're one of the largest genera out of the 10, and they have over 100 species. And specifically what differentiates the female um, cycads from cycads from the other nine genera is that they don't produce cones, they actually produce megasporophylls. So on the right, you see they're all cycads plants and the ones with the little seeds have already been pollinated. So those are the megasporophylls. So why are they important? So they're basically the most endangered group in the whole world out of all types of plants to mammals to invertebrates. And as you can see on the bottom left, there's the IUCN red list. And basically any animal or any species, specific species that is placed in the near threatened is put onto the red list to the right. So this is just basically saying that cycads at 62% has the most, as a group, has the most species, individual species in the red list. And another importance is that although they're one of the oldest plant groups, they're very severely understudied compared to other species and groups. And by being able to understand or the importance of studying cycads is you will be able to understand like how the environment and the climate was in the back. Like it's basically a window to the past. So why am I doing this? <laughs> so basically my question was, is there a relationship between leaf length, leaflet length, number of leaves and the height of the plant? And basically to be able to understand that there are general morphological patterns that can not only be found in the cycads gen genus, but also if this can be applied to the other nine genera. So as you see to my right, I am praising uh, Encephalitis <laughs> <laughs> that was found in the SF uh, Botanical Gardens. So I just want to give you all an idea of what these of my, the things I was studying, because I actually did not have any idea. So on the very left, you have the plant height. So from the very top of the leaf all the way down to the bottom, to the trunk or caudex, that will be like considered with the plant height. In the middle, we have the leaf, so where it connects to the caudex or the trunk, all the way to the very tip is what was measured. And then on each, on the leaf, there's the leaflets that make up the leaf. So starting from like where the, on the very right, where the little leaflet starts from the stem, goes all to the edge is what was measured. So Dr. Natalie and her crew went um, a couple years back in Australia and recorded the, the cycads, yeah, and the both territories that I'm gonna explain later. But they recorded on the iPad and recorded, measured everything specifically, and yeah. So the two groups that we, or the two regions that I was studying, the, it was in Australia, as you can see in the top right, and the Northern Territory is where all the circles are. And in the Northern Territory, there were four species that were, yeah, species that were studied. And on the graph, you can see the Cycas Armstrongi. There are nine populations and 90 samples. 
for each population that was recorded, it was 10. So 10 specific um, plants is considered a part of a population. So that's why for Makinashe, there's eight groups, 80, and the hybrid Armstrong guys um, by Makinashe only had one group or one population. So then the other region that I studied was, or my information was from, was the Queensland. So as you can see back, the, it, Queensland is found in the very, very top right of, or northeast of Australia. And compared to the uh, North, Northern Territory populations, they were, these populations were all along the coast. And each, each symbol represents a population. So as you can see, C. terriana only has one population, and that's more in the middle. And yeah, so these are Queensland. So my methods. So my methods were very, it was hard to come by, <laughs> my first time doing research. But basically I used, uh, I ran a correlation, linear regression. And with the linear regression, I was able to run from the differences between like leaf length and plant height to leaflet length by plant height and et cetera. So basically the p-value at the very end where it shoots out is p-value, r squared, and some other numbers, but these two are the most important for now. And the p-value basically, if it's less than 0 0.05, it means there's a correlation between the two variables that was tested. So for example, my watching habits, if, <laughs> if I, for every episode of Voltron I watch, it's equal to 30 minutes. So basically, <laughs> there, there's a correlation. So as you can see, there is like the one episode, two episodes, that's 60 minutes. So the importance of the R squared is basically, it tells you the angle or the one-to-one -one relationship of the correlation that was already proven with the p-value. The so if this correlation, this is a perfect example of a one-to-one -one relationship, one episode to 30 minutes. So if it wasn't a perfect linear line or diagonal line, it would be more of like 15 minutes per one episode or one episode for 15 minutes. And it wouldn't be really finished. So this is applied to my results. So for this graph, I did leaf length by plant height. As you can see, this is the image of the leaf. This is the image of the plant height on the bottom right. And at the very top with the legend, I divided each group by the Northern Territory, which are in yellow, and the Queensland Territory, which is in green. And each image or each single dot on the graph represents one, uh, one, one plant. So what I thought was very important if this, or that was very interesting, was that there is a super clear distinction between the Northern Territory and the Queensland species. So on the very top is the Queensland species, and the bottom is the Northern Territory. And you can obviously, like overall, the Northern Territory has smaller leaf lengths and plant height compared to the Queensland. Another one of my findings that I thought was super interesting was the all Queensland species, um, specifically the leaflet length and leaf length, so the correlation between the two. And you can see the, the, way, the importance of this is due to it has the highest R squared value out of all of the graphs that I ran. So that's between leaflet length and leaf length to leaf length and plant height out of all regions. So basically, like I said before, with the one-to-one -one relationship with the R squared, it's basically saying that for every one, for every one centimeter, it grew like one centimeter, so one centimeter as well. So that's the importance of that. That was super interesting. And one of the final findings was the hybrid trends that I found. And I didn't notice this at first, but as I was going through the graphs, I realized that the hybrids kept falling in between the parent species. So the Northern Territory, I specifically chose this graph because of the leaflet length by plant height of Northern Territory, they showed this the best. And the Armstrong guy by Makinashe is the yellow uh, axis, and they fall in between the Armstrong guy, which is the diamonds, and the Makinashe, which is the triangles. And yeah, so when I saw this, I was really, I was like surprised. I was like, oh wow, this is, 
am I making science? I'm making discoveries. Is it can, can this? I was, so I was like, so this is why I noticed it on just Armstrong guy by Michael Nashe. So I was like, okay, let me check if it's like in the other two hybrids as well. So I checked the other two were media by Platophila and Ophiolithica by Megacarpa. And lo and behold, they showed the same results. And I was, wow. So, <laughs> so, so yeah. And then this is led me to my conclusion of future directions. And so overall, there is a super significant correlation between plant height and leaf length, as well as leaf length and leaf length across all species, across all populations. And another one, another finding that was obviously super fun was hybrid trends. And my question, like, and how they felt in between intermediate, like they felt directly in between both parent species. And one of the questions I had, like, I had multiple, one of them is to see if like this same trend can be found across the other genera, other nine genera, and how can this, like just one find, like obviously further research by more professional people, um, can give us a better understanding of cycads and cycads in general, and how they reproduce and how they populate, repopulate. And I don't know if I could play a video or not, but on the right, very right, there's a video recorded by a drone that Dr. Manuel Luján sent out a couple of years back. And I was connecting my research, basically by this understanding or these sick findings can be applied, if they could be applied to these, these images, these drone images. So not being able to like currently, obviously with our current pandemic, we won't be able to like walk around or fly around all the way to Australia. This footage that Manuel took, Dr. Manuel took can be even like used even more with like the correlations that were found um, in my findings. So and this will overall help with conservation efforts because once we'll be able to identify if let's say on the very top right, the cycad, and if we can measure them the length of those leaves and the amount of leaves they have, we can see how old they are. Because as I what talked about before, like the height of a plant determines its age. And if we be able to identify the population demographics and the health of each population, we'll be able to see if that single population, let's say in Queensland, is dying out or if it already has its smaller um, plants about to replace the older ones. So basically, if you take anything away from this, cycads are super cool, and further research has to be done to aid in their conservation due to their importance in understanding their past. You too can do scientific research. So basically, this made me think of how I have no experience doing this research, so I was super grateful for this opportunity, and how thinking of the barriers and how expensive it is to actually go out and do research and how like science in general is super expensive to do research in, this being able to have these these results and can be seen like or applied to like a video that you can be in your own house. Like we said, most of us stayed in the <laughs> in Belvedere eighteen twenty two <laughs> um, for hours just on our computers. So this just showed me how research does not have to be in a lab, and it cannot does not have to be limited to financial like restraints. And overall, just have fun. And just want to say thank you. I'm so grateful for everyone. Started with Dr. Natalie Nagalingo because she was real patient, would explain to me concepts. Um, Dr. Manuel Luhang for his videos. For my homie Michelle for his <laughs> holding it down to psych of the years, and. Amber, and it helped me understand our values, our squares. And thank you for Dr. Rebecca and Dr. Lauren for making it possible. And I haven't said for funding. So, yeah, thank you. <laughs> questions? Do we have any questions from this room? Yeah. Oof. Let's go back to the to the graphs. So specifically for this one, the leaf length. Um, so it obviously varies. So as you can see, Armstrong guy has it's a little diamond. It's kind of hard to see on the screen, but they like vary from each one. But honestly, we don't like have a a specific thing. Like this is just showing like that there is a relation, mm -hmm. and like further research has to be done to see how like how long it actually takes. Um, and yeah, but. 
Yeah. <laughs> we do have a question from Gabriela who asks, very, says, first, very interesting talk. Uh, do you have any thoughts about what the benefits of the hybrids in an ecological context are? The benefits of the of a hybrid, hybrid in, in an ecological, ecological context. Like, how would they be? How would it be beneficial to hybridize? I think overall, remember, I'm not a professional, and we don't really know about this, so this is me going off on a limb. But I think, especially for specific populations, like let's say, like Teriana, there wasn't that many um, samples of it. Uh, which didn't lead to like that much analysis, but if that species was able to hybridize with another one, as long we'll know that the hybridization, like the hybridized species, will at least have half of that Teriana's um, genes, like genetic makeup. So we'll know at least part of that DNA or part of that history um, can be saved. So I guess in the context of like ecological something, that that's the importance of it, I guess. But that's just me going off on a limb. But. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. I mean, I think like, your species doesn't go extinct if you can hybridize. Exactly, you, yeah. Not all the genes are lost. Um, so you've talked a little bit about like how exciting it was, like the moment that you realized that you were getting results that were significant. Yeah. Uh, I guess I'm curious whether that was the most exciting thing about your project this summer or whether there were was any other aspect of it that, that um, you were more excited about or surprised you more. Yeah, so as <laughs> the upper department knows, I was struggling to, like the learning curve was steep. So <laughs> so I was just be days just, I don't understand this. And then I don't know when that first graph pulled up, I screamed at Michelle because I was like, yo, I finally understand this. Um, so honestly, like being able to have results and like continuously being supported by my peers and my mentors um, was, yeah, it was like the best part to be able to have like results and to be able to like finally explain this in a way that isn't too hard, I guess. Yeah, and um, Gio made a really really good point in the in the chat, which pertains to all of you really, I think, um, which is just that you you are actually a pro. You just got paid to do research, and that therefore makes you a professional. So you said you're not a pro, I mean, but <laughs> I mean. <laughs> <laughs> okay, these were really, really amazing talks. Uh, and let's thank Luigi again and bring Rebecca back out here. Okay, wow. I feel pretty amazed by the set of talks that we just saw, Rebecca. Uh, what do you think? Like, what, what, what are your thoughts after hearing <laughs> three hours of incredible research. Yeah, I mean, I think um, I was just so happy and amazed, like not amazed because I knew these students could do it, but I think it was it was hard to figure out what their research was gonna look like this summer. And so to really see the time and dedication and effort that the students put in and mentors as well to help um, facilitate research experiences this summer, um, it was just really great to see. Um, I was just so proud of everyone. I think Luigi's um, kind of sum up of his discovery of this hybrid, um, th what he saw in the hybrids and then looking for the patterns in the other groups, just kind of to me highlighted like the joys of doing research. Um, and I know even if it's not the research you had planned, right? And that you can have this discovery and just paying attention and asking questions and I think all of everyone really demonstrated that core of research and the thing that I think both of us with Lauren, you and I have been, you know, our goals for the program, no matter pandemic or not, <laughs> is that um, come away with this ability to try things and ask questions and then try things when and you run into a problem, ask more questions and learn. And I, I really saw that demonstrated today. So I'm just super proud and want to congratulate everybody. I couldn't agree more. And, and I'd also just like to say, um, you know, they say it takes a village. And I think that that couldn't be, couldn't be any less true this year. Uh, it really took a village to, to bring this entire research program together. Uh, and that was really from all aspects of the academy, from public programs to communications to Laurel Allen, who facilitated this entire symposium. Um, to, to security, design, who to set security. us up for today. I mean, it's everyone, right? So absolutely. Um, and so with that, I, I'd actually just like to, to bring out a couple of special guests that are going to 
kind of um, sum up the symposium, say a few closing remarks. The first is our, our very own chief of science, Dr. Shannon Bennett, uh, and our executive director, Dr. Scott Sampson, uh, who are, we're gonna turn it over to them and, and let them say a couple of words. Thank you. Thanks, Laura, uh, Lauren and Rebecca. I, I just wanna say how deeply, deeply impressed I am. I, I didn't catch the entire day, but I, I caught a, a suite of afternoon talks and I interacted with many of you in the field and, and got to witness part of your journey. And I just have to say, you are indeed professional scientists and I'm deeply impressed with the amount of work that you were able to accomplish. I am so um, thrilled to be a part of an academy uh, that can reinvent itself and innovate out of this uh, this crazy, un, you know, unforeseen situation of COVID-19, uh, and that includes the interns. You're part of our family now. You're part of the academy, as well as the advisors and Rebecca and Lauren for your leadership. I am so incredibly moved to uh, see what this has accomplished, what we've accomplished together, considering what we started with and all the unknowns. And we didn't back away from that fight and we had hit it head on. And I think we are, I'm even more impressed than I've been uh, in former years of what we've been able to accomplish. So, so thank you all. Thank you for your innovation, your brilliance, your leadership. Uh, the interns, the advisors, uh, Rebecca and, and Lauren, thank you. And Laurel Allen, thank you. And I will just step in and I don't know that I can add much to what Shannon just said. Uh, it is remarkable. First of all, most importantly, psych ads really are cool. Thank you, <laughs> that's a really important thing to, to get settled in that. We all need to walk away with that. Second of all, I wanna uh, underline the fact that you are all professional scientists now. You are actually doing science and getting paid for it. And don't take that lightly, it's, it's a big deal. Um, third, I wanna say that from what I've heard going through this process that um, you all have done an amazing job at adapting and pivoting that this program really is rooted in getting people outside and together and working in close quarters, getting you actually on the ground in nature, doing measurements, etc. And the fact that you were limited in your ability to do that and even get together to chat and you still switched to this online format is quite remarkable. And just the other day I heard that there were even pros and cons involved. There, were, Yes, there were certain things you couldn't do, but in fact, there were certain things that you could do because you were online that it was easier to attend because you didn't have the travel to get to the academy or if you had kids you have to look after, you could do that. And so I'm really excited. You've given me hope about this kind of online learning that we really can do it and make it effective. And at this crazy moment in history, um, we have to start thinking about alternative ways of learning and learning together in, in groups like this. So thank you, you've, you've helped me figure this out and, uh, and given me hope about what we can do in the future as well. So I just wanna say congratulations to all of you and to uh, Rebecca and Lauren, I mean, amazing that you were able to shift and pull this off um, and congrats, enjoy. And I look forward to following um, your progress. And uh, as Shannon said, you are all part of the Academy family now. So please stay in touch. No, not yet. Oh! <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye. <laughs> <laughs>